is going on, guys? It's Brian Jack with Some Men's Comics, and we are back with those trends in the comic community. That's right. This is the three up, three down, but this is a very special episode. This is going to be our end of the year episode where we are capturing trends throughout 2020. It's also a special episode because this week is going to be the last week for content on Simple Man's Comics YouTube until the brand new year. We are going to take time off. We're going to spend time with our family. We're going to spend the holidays with our family. We might have a video or two that come up, but for the regular content, this is going to be the last week for 2020, right, Jack? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we did this last year, and uh, I think it was it was a great success. Real refreshing for us. I think it allowed us to kind of get some new content ideas and hit the ground running uh, into the new year. And we can't thank you guys enough in the Simpleman's Comics family for 2020, a year that was really a difficult year for for so many, including us in our in our own lives. But uh, here on the channel, we saw incredible growth. We just hit 20,000 subscribers and we appreciate each and every one of you. Um, and I think that while I know some people don't, you know, don't aren't happy to see a break in the content schedule. We promise you guys, it, it all leads to bigger and better things in 2021. Yeah, we're gonna tweak some things. We're gonna revamp some things. We might come out with some new content ideas, but most assuredly, I know Jack and I, but both could use the rest. Everyone gets suffers through burnout. We are no different. We are kind of going through burnout and holidays is just that time where everyone wants to spend time with the family. So I'm looking forward to that. And like Jack said, we appreciate each and every one of you, you guys are family as well. We are going to have an exclusive hangout during that time for Patreon members. I already talked to some of them, so we will be doing that. But for the time being, new content will begin after this week in January of 2020. But with that being said, let's get into the three up, three down for the year. Starting with the upward trends, the big one we have right now, which no one can deny is not up but we are talking about streaming services between Netflix, between Amazon, between even Hulu, and between Disney Plus and even more news that came out of that Disney investor call. No doubt streaming services are up. Yeah, and, and so much to how they relate to comic books. Um, they've really changed the game of television speculation in 2020. Uh, television speculation was incredibly popular around the age of like 2015, 2016, that era. And then you saw 2017, 2018, 2019, people get kind of burnt out. Uh, Netflix didn't pan out the way that people had hoped with the Marvel Universe. Um, some of the CW stuff, the villain of the week, it, it became such a burn and turn game that it couldn't sustain uh, long term. But we're seeing a whole new world with streaming services, with content being able to be delivered in a bingeable format, as well as on a weekly episodic release for like some of the most popular shows, like say The Boys or Mandalorian. People have gravitated towards getting their content in this fashion. Uh, and we have seen an increase in the amount of comic book IP that has landed on streaming service, both in television form as well as in uh, feature film form. This year we saw, you mentioned like the big players, Netflix, uh, you know, obviously Hulu um, and Amazon releasing, uh, you know, their typical kind of releases. We saw the boys from Amazon doing major, major numbers, which gave way for Invincible. We saw Netflix continuing with Umbrella Academy, moving into all these IDW properties like V Wars and Lock and Key. Um, we saw a first look deal signed between Boom and Netflix that should really play out in 2021 and beyond when we start seeing these Boom Studios major releases hit the Netflix platform. But we also saw Netflix be a major player with uh, movies like Extraction coming from the uh, um, graphic novel See You Dodd. And that was a huge hit in 2020. But now HBO Max is coming and is going to be basically the the hub for DC Comics in 2021, both with television shows and the feature films going straight to HBO Max upon release uh, for all HBO Max subscribers, as well as Disney Plus really changing the game, especially post Disney Investor Call. We're recording this after the Disney Investor Call, where now we know in the next few years, we're going to get like 10 more Marvel shows and 10 more Disney show or uh, Star Wars shows. I mean, the amount of comic book tie-in content is staggering. And that's not even to mention some of the more overlooked releases that still tie into the comics, like Why the Last Man on FX that was announced that kind of 
flew under a lot of people's radar. So streaming has really changed the game uh, for the comic book market in 2020 and has brought TV speculation back to the forefront and I think become an avenue for independent comics to get their stuff out there and has allowed for the big two to expand far beyond what like a one or two movie a year release schedule would allow them to character wise. Yeah, and the great thing also was a year ago when Disney Plus first launched, they had that where you could sign up for three years in mm -hmm. advance. And I think it was like eight bucks or something. It was a great price. And I'm glad I did because they also announced that Disney Plus will raise the price of their subscription service by like a dollar within the next year. But even if you're just now coming on board with all the content that they just announced, I don't think anyone will complain for that extra dollar. But the next one I want to talk about for the upper trends for 2020 is... This definitely was a, a no-no at the beginning of 2020, but now everyone seems to be talking about it. And we are glad that it is finally out there and people are discussing it. And we are talking about comic book final order cutoff. Yeah, right. The big no-no of 2019 is just widely accepted in 2020. It's baffling. Um, I, I really honestly didn't think there would be a time. When you and I first started discussing doing our FOC show, and again, we like to say um, Spidey Fan, I believe is the name of the channel, uh, was the first um, that we had ever heard of, but we didn't hear about that till after we had debuted our show. Um, but I want to credit him as being one of the first, but we were the first amongst those who had kind of a substantial following who had something to lose because people were starting to look at the market at that time. And they were starting to look at those of us who spoke on YouTube and always imagining that everything we said, it was because we had some personal financial gain in whatever it was that we were book we were talking about. And it, it took time for people to kind of realize that th through watching and through, uh, you know, viewing the content that that's not what we're about. I'm not going to say that every YouTube channel isn't about that. It, you kind of have to take each one on its own individually, but um, that allowed us to feel confident to say, you know what, well, this is content that we think the community needs and we're not afraid of whatever backlash we're going to get. And we got backlash. We got a lot of backlash. There were comic book collecting communities, speculation communities um, that were posting links to our video and advocating for people to come thumbs down it, not realizing that all they were doing was increasing our engagement, which was only putting this video in front of more and more people. And we knew that it would be a hit with comic book retailers, as well as collectors who weren't able to keep up on these dates. A lot of them weren't even aware that these like secret cutoff dates existed amongst retailers and distributors. And we knew that the publishers would like it. And sure enough, they they jumped on board and it got to a point where it was so universally popular. We started to see the very naysayers who told us that this content could not exist, start to deliver this content themselves. And to be honest with you, I've been asked a lot this year, like, was this a um, kind of like a ha ha, I told you so moment, but it honestly isn't. And uh, because for, at least for me, Brian, you can speak to yourself. I'm just so happy that this is something we can talk about. I hated these arbitrary rules. Um, and you and I would sit there and say, well, who made this rule that you can't talk FOC? Um, there was a belief, and for anyone who's not, who's not aware, there was a belief that talking about a book before FOC would artificially raise print runs and make it you know, so that a book could not then be popular on the secondary market. And time and time again has proven, no matter how much you talk about a book uh, before FOC, the market is ultimately going to decide. Each person has to individually make a decision whether or not they want to order that book before that cutoff date. And what happens in the secondary market only matters if that demand has to outweigh whatever that supply is. And if that demand is strong enough, it does not matter what the supply is. And the increase in supply increases awareness, which a lot of times leads to demand. And we saw that a lot in 2020. So I'm happy to see FOC being such a well-known, well-talked about thing. I hate seeing DC play games with the dates of FOC. I know you do too. But Brian, I'd love to hear what your, your opinion on FOC in 2020 was. 
Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's great that other YouTubers are talking about it now. I think it's it's great that it's well accepted. I think there's it's great outside of YouTube. You got other websites that are hitting on Final Order Cutoff as well. So the more it's talked about, I think it brings more attraction to the hobby, makes people more aware. And also it's savvy for those collectors out there. Yeah. We hint at it and everyone else is hinting at it. By doing those pre-orders, you save money, you guarantee yourself a copy and you also get those discounts. Now, yes, people were naysayers. People were really pissed off when we first started doing it. But that just doubles down on if you're a YouTube creator, create the content you want to create, do what you want to do. Don't worry about what other people are going to say, because it's a prime example right now with FOC when people hated on it, people commented on it. People are like, ha mom, did you just see what I did? I just made everyone thumbs down their video. I'll take the trash out when I'm ready, mom. Gosh, I'm 35 years old. Those are the type of people that are doing it. Ignore them. Make it the content you want to create. And it's your channel. Do what you want to do. FOC is great. I'm glad other YouTubes are talking about it. And I'm glad it's, it's bringing more attraction to the hobby. But with that being said, we're getting into that third down. And we are talking about licensed properties. This was one hell of a year for licensed properties. The two ones that we always talk about, especially on this channel, Ninja Turtles, Power Rangers. But there was more than that that actually caught some heat, right? Yeah, this was a uh, really a huge year. And this is another one where you and I have been talking about licensed properties for a, a number of years that we felt like it was kind of, <coughs> I was trying to avoid that. <clears throat> Start from the top. Yeah, definitely, Brian. And this is another one where you and I kind of talked about this when we first kind of got together a couple of years ago. And we kind of had this belief that licensed properties were going to have their day. A lot of it's due to nostalgia, but I think that it far exceeded this year our own expectations. And that's largely due to the success of the one licensed property that you and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't successful. And that's Star Wars. Star Wars being what it was this year uh, for Marvel, the, the back issues doing what they did for Dark Horse, um, it's incredible and it's really driven the hobby. And then you mentioned two other properties. Uh, Power Rangers went from being a property that was oftentimes laughed at when you would try to bring it up within the comic community to now being widely accepted as a reader buzz week in and week out. They're uh, so good. They cross over. They did a crossover with it. <laughs> right. This is so in, in so good. Now we have two Power Ranger series um, and the quality isn't split amongst the two. They're different and they, and they interact and um, they're, they're excellent. And then with Ninja Turtles, we saw a boom, like, just we couldn't imagine and it's funny it all stems from us saying kind of like hypothetically like pay attention to issue 101 like 51 was a huge issue this is kind of like what they did and they built an entire 50 issue run on what happened in issue 51 with jenica and that jenica explosion most people expected to die off after issue 100 but it didn't why because with issue 101 we had so much happen so many new characters that are now creating so much reader buzz within the new series that it also ends up doing that spillover effect into nostalgia. We're seeing the back issues get bought up. The Archie stuff's getting bought up. High grade issues are getting bought up. The late prints are getting bought up. Issue number ones are going for record prices at Heritage and other auction houses. It's really been astounding this year. And then on top of all of that, we get a new last Ronin comic that comes out and it just kills. And if that wasn't enough, you had G.I. Joe hit its 275th issue and have a huge 10-month, 10 10-part 10 storyline this year. We talked about Masters of the Universe with an incredible, incredible story that brought anti-He-Man into the, the, the world of comics, which I still think could be a long-term great, great play. Um, and we saw, at least for a moment of time, some serious popularity surrounding that character and that series. And then the whole move with alien and predator going to marvel now that's going to largely play out in 2021 i think in 2021 when we're doing year end stuff i have a feeling we're going to be talking about alien and predator but it really goes to show the way that licensed properties are now being viewed by all publishers including ones from the big two uh there is money in these licenses and if you can take these nostalgic properties and do them right uh, they, there's the sky's the limit. So I can't wait to see what licensed properties are going to pop off in 2021. Yeah. I mean, we've also heard rumor that some licensed properties will actually be moving publishers. Yes. They'd be anxious to see if those rumors play out, but as long as they're still being made, I'm happy. 
So we've gone over the three uptrends for 2020. We could have put so many more in here. Oh, yeah. But we want to keep it to three up, three down this week. And we're going to go over into those three downtrends for 2020. And one of the big ones, I would say, you could take this any year. It's always a downward trend. But we got damages. We got damages from Diamond. We got damages, especially from ourselves, participating in the uh, exclusive variants. Uh, that was an experience in itself. And those damages, there's something that, you know, I definitely take exclusive variants and people that produce them. I see it in a whole new light now due to those damages and trying to get replacements mm -hmm. and, and, uh, sometimes publishers i won't say don't seem to care but it's just like hey it's just part of the biz bro yeah so the yeah you, you you're not wrong um there's so much to say here because you said you said it that like this could be down in a year and it really could um and i don't i to be honest full disclosure i don't necessarily know that i can say it's down worse this year than the other year or whether our involvement in it got so much larger yeah, it's definitely brought to the surface on our side right we got exposed to um and listen here's and i, I want to explain this if we're just talking about damages books being damaged right when they're shipped that's a problem that's easily fixable where we see a hole in the hobby is there are too many problems involving printing packing and shipping um as well as the general oversight of the whole process to really pinpoint one problem, this is a market-wide issue. And I think it was really exposed in 2020 when the retail shut down and the entire game moved to online. Exclusive variants could have very easily been on the upside of this list. To be honest with you, one of the large reasons I didn't put them on this list is because I know that they are a personal sour spot for my partner, Brian. <laughs> so I didn't put him. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> so I didn't put him on the, uh, I didn't put him on the up part uh, of this list, but they largely, it, it very much like FOC, they largely became a thing that was thought of as taboo that has now been widely accepted as a fun form of collecting. Uh, you can buy what you like, play at your own risk sort of thing. So during this pandemic, I, I really feel like a lot of these exclusives and things like that and these online retailers, they kept, the hobby running largely um, and it really kind of exposed where some of the issues uh, lie because it, again, if we we're just simply talking about damages, that's one thing, but Brian, we saw books shipped to the wrong stores. We saw books lost just in general. Like, I don't know where your book is. You printed 1500 of a variant and I don't know where it is. Yeah. Um, and, and something's not exclusive when you <laughs> no longer the exclusive Bermuda Triangle, right? There's 1500 of your book in the wind. Um, we experienced, uh, oh, your book shows up and there's no incentives, and we don't know where those are or what, what happened with that. Um, we experienced uh, the and same, you're not getting any, yeah. Oh, we found 20, we'll ship them to you, and they come damaged, right? And, and right, <laughs> you know, and then you're seeing other retailers put lots of 10 and 20 of the same variants tank in the market and you're sitting there with none and it's 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 frustrating um you know you're sitting there um looking at three books in a row from the same publisher coming from a third-party printer all having the same printer defect and and not getting that fixed or worked out um is extremely extremely frustrating and i get from the publisher standpoint that they're not they're not the ones dealing with it and some of it falls on the retailers um we were very critical of retailers who we felt like put artificial print runs. Like if they had to print 500 of a book from a publisher who said 300. And then we learned that largely it's because of some of these issues. But the problem with that is if they're getting 200 damaged books out of 500, they're not always reporting those to the, to the to publishers, which means that the publishers aren't aware of what those mistakes are and yeah. can't correct them. So I understand it from all sides, but I think the biggest problem is the publishers need to put somebody in charge of quality control. There has to be somebody who is in between where the books get printed and how they end up in retailers hands, specifically exclusive variants. Because if you bought exclusive variants this year, um, I'm sure you had at least one book that you bought this year from some retailer, from some publisher. Um, you got that dreaded email that said, Hey, all the books came in damaged and we got to reprint uh, that. I mean, that happened. There's not one publisher who's, who's guilty of this. There's not one publisher who's not guilty of this. They, it's happened to all of them across the board. And then Diamond, we still have the same old problems. 
Um, just like I think that the pub each publisher uh, needs to have somebody who is in charge of that quality control. Diamond still runs their warehouse like they're packing for a Walmart. You know, they're they're not treating it like they're just, just shipping greeting cards. Damn it! <laughs> right, we're not treating it like these are collectibles. Um, and greeting cards is a very good is a very good comparison because you, you don't want a greeting card beat up. And for the most part, the comics aren't totally beat up. But a ding in the corner of a greeting card isn't even something you notice. But Especially a comic when it's incentives. And yeah, when issue it, incentives. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it's it is extremely frustrating. Books you can't replace. Um, there there was just so much of that this year, and it it's tough because you know it affects the bottom line of, of retailers. There are there especially we talk smaller about, retailers. Yeah, and we talk smaller about smaller retailers order five hundred copies of a book to get that one in five hundred. Yep. And then the one in five hundred comes in crappy. It's kind of like you know. Well, I never would have ordered those five hundred yeah. books, um, and and it's also. It, it, we talk a lot of, uh, in, in, within the hobby about, you know, LCSs are the lifeblood. I've heard every publisher, specifically, every publisher who has come on this channel has said, uh, you know, LCSs are the lifeblood. And then my, and I believe that that's the way the publishers think because they are, but then they need to do more to support this aspect of the hobby um, because it is drowning retailers between damages from diamond operating between 10 and 20 percent for the average retailer and store exclusive producers having to regularly trash entire shipments to large percentage of shipments and slow up the entire process as well as the money um and and lose customer trust um all of that going on at once uh it really really difficult in an area of the business that sh should be fixable it's, it's logistics it's quality control, um, and these are all things that in any sort of product manufacturing are parts of the process. They just seem to be really missing from our process. And if we're going to have a single distributor um, for like Boom, Image, uh, Marvel, uh, Dynamite, et cetera, then those companies need to implore uh, Diamond to put somebody on the floor with collectibles knowledge to make sure that these books are packed safely and that whatever little expense they need to in bubble wrap, in paper, in filler cardboard, in whatever they've got to use should be looked at as a welcome expense compared to the mountains of damages they have to be dealing with. Yeah, I mean, we're speaking from the little experience that we've had and I will admit that that experience has also been as a third party Jack and I, we didn't have diamond accounts. We yep. partnered with 616, but just the, the communication and some of those diamonds. And then of course, just stuff you see from other retailers on Instagram and all these other posts. And I know we have other retailers that watch these videos that watch our channel. We'd love to hear from you what, what your comments are, good or bad. We're not, I'm not attacking any specific publisher. It's just one of the downward trends that we experienced over the 2020. So we definitely like to get the, um, opinion of one, the retailers, and then also the buyers as well, because we know people bought exclusive rants and re received those emails and, and how they felt. Because I know that sometimes they felt uh, uh, retailers are just saying that because they want to, you know, books are starting to heat up and they want to sell it on the secondary market. Um, I can tell you for a fact that that wasn't us, because even after we we didn't get the books, but you can definitely look on. I don't sell anything on eBay for once. Right. I, yeah, we, neither of us have listed any of our exclusives on eBay ever. Yeah. So, I mean, that's in, it, for, for us, it, it, it getting, hearing that a hot book that's doing well in the secondary market, which as an exclusive variant producer is something you're proud of. We're very proud of the books that are performing well on the secondary market. It means that we achieved our goal of desirability within the marketplace. Yeah. Finding out that you're going to have to delay those shipments is, is some of the most heartbreaking things you have to kind of go through in, in this business. So it was very tough. Uh, it's, it's hard on these, these companies and it's why. The big companies are able to kind of sustain and you see those smaller variant producers. They're the ones who struggle. Um, so like shout out to like some of our channel sponsors, like Frankie's who's grown leaps and bounds over the last year, uh, who easily could be on the up part of this list as well as black Cape comics, another shop that was kind of one of those places that was small enough to really struggle with some of these issues and has kind of elevated to that next level. So shout out to both of them who had a great 2020. That's going to move us into the second downward trend of 2020. And we're talking about publishing staffing. We've seen multiple publishers, two that come to mind, IDW, DC Comics. I don't know if it was 
abnormal for 2020, but it definitely seemed more publicized, but we saw more staffing turnover and we saw more uh, news about it, especially with NIDW. And then of course, towards the tail end of this year with uh, DC and how Warner Brothers was kind of doing some of that turnover. Yeah, absolutely. And we even experienced it to a small degree with Image and Dynamite um, with some of the contacts that we had within the exclusive variant business. Um, so now there's turnover in every business, right? That's natural. That's going to happen. Um, and then in a pandemic, I, I think that's understandable that that's happened in just about every business across this country. Um, but there was, it's, it's, I don't think it's a coincidence. The company IDW had like the same position turnover like three times in about four months. Yeah. And blaming that on a pandemic is kind of short-sighted, right? Cause there was also some me too issues. Um, there were also, this has been, a, IDW specifically has had an issue with profitability for the last several years, which people always attribute to their publishing side. No, no, no. They make money on the publishing very little, but they, they're doing well on the publishing side trying to take their businesses into production and produce their own um, TV and movies. They, they're the producers of their shows um, has been a uh, costly business for them to get into. Um, they've lost CEOs. They've lost marketing direct. They've lost so many heads in that company. It's very difficult um, to know who's in charge in 2020. That's been very tough with IDW. And it's, it's interesting because editorially, that you've still seen some of those important names like uh, Tom Waltz front and center. They've had an amazing year with the Ninja Turtles stuff and the last Ronin stuff, but staffing wise, they couldn't take it to that next level because a lot of the things they were missing. And then you mentioned DC, another company that was really hit by being a, a corporate driven stock, uh, uh, you know, publicly traded company um, definitely affected the bottom line when AT&T had to make kind of company wide staffing cuts and DC saw the belt tightened and, and so many lost their jobs. It was unfortunate. It, I think it's, I don't want to say it's going to be for the better. Cause I don't think that anyone losing their job is going to be, that's not a good thing. Um, but I, as I will say, and you and I have both discussed this before that the DC cutting the number of titles they're publishing down is going to be for the better of, of their brand of, of their business. I think that that's going to give quality over quantity um, which is what I think most of us in the comic community are demanding. So it, tough year for staffing. Um, I think you got to give it a mulligan this year because of the pandemic, I think. Um, but I do think it's interesting that some of the staffing issues came from some of the companies that tend to have staffing issues. Then the last one we want to talk about for a downward trend, which we put this on the down, but I think depending on which side of the hobby you fall on, it could be yeah. up or down. But we have exclusivity of information. Exclusivity of uh, of information was certainly rendered almost non-existent in 2020. Um, so, from an aspect that's down, that's that's unquestionably down. Now, how people feel about that? Um, that's where I think there's going to be a lot of room for discussion. Now, you and I, we are purveyors of free information here on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. Now, yes, we have a Patreon, um, and yes, we will um, post things first there sometimes, and there's been exclusive stuff, and I need to get m back more active with the Bolo Club and things like that. But um, for the most part, most of what we do, we are very upfront and open, and, and, and a lot of the YouTubers within the community, that's the way um, they go about distributing content. And we've seen more and more content move from these private message boards, which still exist. There's always going to be private message boards, but the private message boards that really drove and directed the hobby when you and I got back into comic collecting in like 2010 area um, isn't really the thing at this point. Um, you don't have to be a member of some Illuminati collecting club uh, to find out what is going on because you know there are great YouTube channels out there whether or not, and, and it all kind of depends on what you're looking for. Uh, we're not for everybody, but there, there's a channel out there for everybody in the comic collecting community. Um, and there's a lot of great ones. And certainly we want to be your comic collecting show. We want to be the, sh the, the, the channel that you tune into for your content. But um, at the same point, if you want to be the best you can be in the comics uh, collecting or reselling game, then well, you're going to need to take in a lot of content from a lot of different voices and hear a lot of different opinions. And what that has done is get information out there just faster. You look at the Disney uh, conference call or uh, investor uh, presentation and how fast things happen since then. Like these, 
these, this information was put out and then immediately you could find key issue breakdowns from YouTubers on websites. The key collector app was certainly a major, major uh, factor in that. Now, while that's behind a paywall um, that I think it's like a 20 or $25 annual paywall is certainly a small enough paywall that most collectors valued that um, same with like tools like cover price, go collect. Um, I think most people viewed those tools um, in 2020 as a major part of well, what they did. Uh, so it, this continued innovation, we just talked about comicquery.com, a new website um, that, that is kind of like a database for available comics on the open market. All of these innovative tools and as well as um, these social media avenues are allowing people to share information, share opinions, um, and there's no more barrier. If you remember back in the message board days, you had to get clout before you could get a position to be able to say anything um, and have a platform for people to listen to you. Now, man, you can sign up, jump on YouTube. You can just use your phone. You can use your laptop uh, uh, camera, um, or you can get the most expensive rig out there. It's up to you. And you can go share your opinion. And there's everything in between available uh, right now. So it's amazing. And I think that that's only going to continue um, to be bigger innovation um, and kind of the openness and, and free spread of information, I think is going to continue in 2021. Yeah. It always reminded me of the old Tom and Jerry cartoon, right? <laughs> when he's like this, and then I'm trying to see what's in it. And the next thing you know, he ends up hitting him in the eye. Um, that's kind of how you used to, I mean, to an extent, it still is. Some people are still exclusive. There's, yeah. uh, like you said, there's still those message boards. Are still, I don't say, underground's not the right word, but there's still small uh, communities that are like that. And of course, they get upset when other people start talking about stuff that they wanted to keep quiet. But you, you have that in multiple hobbies. You have that across different niches. I mean, that's it, that's always going to be there. But we live in the information age and information travels fast now. Sometimes it's, even if it's inaccurate, it still goes quick, um, you know, and that's not, that, that's just observation. I mean, well, that's it. That's I've the been guilty. We've been guilty of it ourselves before on this channel where we put something out and then find out that the, the information was erroneous or incorrect. And we've tried to correct that. that that's just the nature of it is. Um, but a lot of people don't like that that information goes out so quick. And a lot of people in the hobby think, oh, because they've been collecting for so long, they, they have their own opinions of how things should operate. So they think news is bad news or it's a, not erroneous news, but oh, these people are crazy. They're going after this. That's why we always say buy what you like. And I, and I also like the information that goes out because that's how the new collectors become those more experienced collectors through those life experiences, whether it's good, bad or indifferent. That's what builds that experience within your own collecting hobby. And that's where you find out what you actually like and don't like. And then you kind of hone your collection. I hardly ever chase stuff anymore. I, I buy the stuff that I want in my collection. I, I don't really flip. I don't really resell outside of the exclusives that we were doing from a retail point of view. And you know how I feel about that now. I have nothing to do with that. I don't have the time for it. But yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear, I know we're going to hear comments, but I also love to hear what you guys think, because I mean, this is something that transcends the hobby and transcends other, other collecting hobbies as well. But with that being said, guys, there was a lot of stuff we could have put on the down. I know Comic-Con, there's probably something that people are probably putting in the comments right now. Oh, for Convention sure. season was a bust. That was a huge downward trend. But we also could have put in the upward trends, virtual cons. Virtual cons took off. And, you know, uh, Mainframe Comic-Con, Comic Core, San Diego Comic-Con. What, what do you think? You think we're going to see more of that? Let us know in the comments as well. I kind of want to get back to the old school. Oh Comic man, I can't wait. Digging through dirty boxes. Yeah. You know, telling people take a damn bath. <laughs> but I want to do it. But I want to do it where I'm only worried about the normal infectious diseases that you have to worry about at a comic convention, <laughs> not, not pandemic spreading ones. But, uh, but for sure. Also, live sales this year. Yeah. Claim, live claim sales. IG, YouTube. Yes. Um, the pandemic so, opened. And we kind of when the when we first started getting news of COVID, we knew that there was going to be innovative. Now a lot of that stuff existed before we, but we knew some that would take off more to kind yeah. of because they, you know, it's like Jeff Goldblum said in Jurassic Park, right? Life finds a way. But um, 
it, it definitely happened within this hobby and other hobbies. But we thank you guys for watching. If this is, we, we will not have a bolo show this week because the new comic book day list was pretty weak, but yeah. we will have last call. And we're going to do a top 10 for the year as well but it's going to be a little bit different. We're not just giving you specific issues in that. So stay tuned for that. But if this is the one video you guys watch, we want to wish you guys a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we'll see you guys in 2020. Sleigh bells ringing, diamonds blingin', carol singing.